Psalm 103, verse 1 to 5. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for your love and mercy in our lives this past week, for we know that all good things come from you. It may not have been an easy week for some of us, but we're thankful that we made it through the week. Please help us live by our faith and rejoice with joy despite our circumstances. Lord, we lift up our Easter outreach event. We ask for good weather, plenty of volunteers and visitors, and a good time of fellowship. But above all, we ask that your Holy Spirit would work ahead of us to touch the heart of people that we will encounter so that they may know you as our creator and the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. Lord, we lift up our impact groups. Let these groups be the means to deepen our relationship with you and with one another. Please grace each leader with your wisdom so that they can continue to lead in the way that is pleasing to you. May each impact group bring glory to you, Lord. Lord, we lift up your workers all over the world we pray that you would grow them in number, and we ask that you provide them with your blessings, strength, and wisdom as they share the gospel um, to further your kingdom. Lord, we give you thanks for your message that we're about to receive through Pastor Yah. Please have your spirit speak your words and truth through Pastor Yah. We ask that your gospel would transform our lives. Please teach us to be sympathetic, to love one another, to be compassionate and humble, just like your son, Jesus Christ. Let us not love with only words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Thank you, Lord, that we can come to you, for it is only truly by your grace and mercy. Not to us, Lord, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Good morning, New Hope. I'm uh, here to just give a quick update on the Easter outreach uh, event. Um, so many of you know that we are going to be having an Easter celebration service here um, on Easter Sunday. Um, but we are also taking this opportunity to uh, do an outreach event to try and um, engage with the community, uh, get the word out about the celebration service, and just um, have a chance to share the gospel, have meaningful conversations, etc. So. Uh, we're having this event on uh, Saturday, April 13th, um, and there's some slides that are coming up. There we go. Uh, so I know Pastor Yash shared a bit of this content before, but one change that I'd like to call out is that we are, instead of going to Mitchell Field for the family uh, location, there's been a change and we're going to go to Hendon Park. Um, so details of that will be communicated, but again, the date will still be Saturday, April 13th uh, from 2 to 4 p.m. So if you uh, go to the next slide, just wanted to give you a feel for um, what it is that we're going to be doing. So uh, Wynn was amazing in the artwork that she's created. Uh, what you see here are some of the basic questions that we're actually going to have on water bottles. Um, and on the far right, the Easter celebration details are going to be on the back of the card. Uh, so we're going to be handing out both those and the pens that you can kind of see the mock-up here. Just some information to generate interest and to, again, have an opportunity uh, not to be so awkward in having those conversations. So the three locations will just be going out and we'll be handing out these water bottles and hopefully people will be attracted or interested in it and uh, just being open to what the Spirit leads. Uh, so if you go to, to the next slide, um, again, Pastor Yash showed this uh, a few weeks ago. And this was originally the plan of what we were going to be doing. Um, Forgive my chicken scratches here, and you're not supposed to be able to read it. Um, but I just really wanted to, to mention and reiterate just how amazing of an experience it's been for myself personally, as well as I think for many of the people that have been involved. This has really been a testimony, I think, to how God is working um, at Uptown, and it's really showing the opportunity for how we can get involved. Many of you have been here for... Um, the past few years, and uh, I, I've gotten the sense, and I felt the same, that there's really, we've been waiting for and looking for opportunities of how to get engaged um, and really be focused more missionally, 
And, and I think that the, this is really one of those opportunities that people have really started taking up the charge. I had no idea what this would turn out to be. Um, but we've got everything from an incredible legal review of the city bylaws to make sure that we're okay to, again, Wynn's artwork. Um, everybody's been stepping in, Rochelle, with all of the, the uh, equipment, the tables and chairs. Um, even Esther are just pulling together the location searches. And there's so many more things, um, Karis and June just stepping up to, to um, act as the focal points for the individual events. I, I'm not going to be able to list everything, but um, it, it's truly been a blessing, and I think that's the message I think that God is really trying to uh, display here, is that as people get involved, we have no idea of what's going to happen. And again, as Pastor Yaw consistently mentions, it's really about being faithful and not really worrying about the results, and he will bless us many times over. Um, so, a couple of things um, that just to emphasize, if you go to the next slide, um, again, this was shown, but uh, we just continue to need to, to pray for this event, and just for us to be open and to be able to submit uh, in whatever ways that God has gifted you in talents. Um, how you can be involved, we, can, we certainly need some help in preparation, in setting up and cleaning up for the event. Um, meaningful conversations, Justin and Ivan's impact group, have taken the lead really to um, practice and train on how to have uh, gospel conversations. And so, um, you know, there's people that would uh, be required to help in that because their impact group is only so many people. Um, so the thing that I'd ask all of you, invite all of you formally, um, we're having a, an impact group leader session uh, next week on Saturday, April 6th. Uh, at 5 p.m. This is part of our normal ongoing monthly impact group leader training, but we're actually um, confiscating this meeting to help prepare and go through all of the things that you're seeing here, but specifically things like training and practicing for some of those gospel conversations, um, cutting out some of the bottle tags that we need help because we have 500 of them, um, but even just stepping up and being involved in those things, I would challenge all of you to do that, and my prayer is that the Leslie office room that we have is going to be just overflowing, and we'll, we won't have enough room, and that'll be an amazing problem to have. Um, so at the very least, you know that it's going to be coming up on, um, uh, the actual event is going to be coming up on April 13th. So if you can come to one of those locations, if you want to see, if you want to get more details, please just come see me. But if you want to take more of a specific part, please show up to this uh, April 6th meeting that we're having and just get involved. And even just to participate in some of the conversations, preparation, we're going to do lots of prayer as well. And so I just invite you to uh, take part in that. Thank you. Thank you, Deacon Paul. Um, so we're going to now transition to the sermon portion of uh, the message. And uh, before we uh, start, I uh, just wanted to remind once again if you can, yeah, we have now, um, we're starting with uh, uh, something new, we're experimenting uh, with something called Q&A, so where we want to encourage um, the congregation to really uh, ask questions, and so that we can answer it as be the best uh, as we can, and uh, it, really the whole uh, purpose of it is for us to really uh, engage uh, in more meaningful ways with the Word of God, and uh, really as we sang today, we want to, through these questions and answers, to really deepen our uh, hunger and thirst for, for God's Word. So, and also we, we believe that uh, uh, it, it takes a community to understand God's word uh, properly, and, we, and the more we can engage with God's word, we can uh, have a better understanding and grasp of who God is. So uh, if you, uh, we encourage that you, for you to uh, text to the number that we are uh, showing on the slide, and uh, uh, in, at any time, and just a reminder that it's also totally anonymous, so feel free to ask any questions, and, we'll, and just for the sake of time, we'll try to uh, answer three questions. And the other ones, uh, we're keeping them uh, in our database, and we are uh, uh, planning to host a, a separate session where we can go through all of those questions together. Okay. So having said that, let's uh, uh, delve into our scripture reading. Uh, today comes from the book, uh, letter of Paul to the Ephesians. So first we'll read uh, from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. You can follow on the screen or on your, uh, on your Bible. Let's read. This is the word of the Lord. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, 
following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, their spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And, then, and we are going to read one more uh, passage. It comes uh, from the same uh, letter of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. So it's chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of, who, of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard of the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of God. Praise be. Thanks be to God. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, great to be worshiping with all of you. And uh, yeah, this week we pay the electricity bill, so we have a utility. Uh, everything is alive and well. Um, if you've been with us over the past uh, month or so, actually, if you weren't here last week, uh, the power went out literally five minutes before worship service started. Uh, and guess when the power actually came back on? Probably within five minutes when our worship service ended. And really, uh, I had such an amazing time. We are all huddled in the first few rows of the pew. Uh, nobody was on stage. We are all right there. And the time of worship was so intimate, so powerful. It really felt like we are part of the early church. Um, yeah, it, it was a great experience. But this week, we have electricity. This is proof that, again, we are a legit church organization. We're not just sneaking into some room. Uh, but yeah, if you've been with us over the past month or so, uh, we are doing a sermon series on the five basic food groups of the gospel. What actually is the gospel? I know we have some newcomers, we have some visitors, and every church, they're going to say, we are all about the gospel. We are all about the gospel. But what does that church believe in when it comes to the gospel? Because sadly, some churches, when they think of the gospel, they just think of financial prosperity. Sadly, some churches, when they think of the gospel, they just really think of it as a humanitarian event, uh, effort. And there's really no relationship with God. So it's really important for us, whether at Uptown or just as Christians in general, what actually is the gospel? And we've been talking about the five basic food groups. We're on the fourth basic food group, which is the question of what is the solution? And I know not everybody has been here over the past few uh, weeks. Uh, and even if you have been, it's a great reminder of what have we covered so far. So the first question, the first basic food group of the gospel is who is God? And if you remember about a month ago, we talked about God according to Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 2, 
our God is so holy above all things. And I know the word holy is not a very common thing that we use, but that basically means God is so powerful. Everything that we see in this universe has, be, has not only been created by God, but has been created by his mere breath. But not only is our God so powerful, so holy, but at the same time, our God is so relational with every single person here. He wants to make himself known. He wants us to make him involved in our lives. And not only has God created all creation in a very good way, but the pinnacle, the peak of God's creation is what? Is humanity. The Bible says out of all of God's creation, and when we think about God's creation, it's marvelous. When we think about the 200 billion galaxies in this world, in this universe, it's truly marvelous. But there's only one creation that actually bears the privilege of bearing the image of God, and that is humans. And we talked about what is humanity, who am I, what does it mean to be in, made in the image of God. We talked about God has given us the capacity to make a difference in society. God has given us the capacity to rule and govern over God's creation. God has given the capacity to have a loving relationship with God himself. We looked at Psalm 8 where it says, God, even though he is so majestic, even though he is so holy, even though he is so much bigger than us, for whatever reason, he is mindful of every human individual. But although God is so glorious, although he is so majestic, although he is so relatable, although he has created us to have this loving relationship with him, something terribly went wrong. And that's what we covered last week. What is the problem? And when we think about this world, man, there is so much evil suffering. When I think about the Holocaust, when I think about even in the backyard of GTA, the Brampton situation a month ago where the father killed his 11-year-old daughter right after her birthday party. I mean, there are, if you just flip on the news, there are just devastation after devastation. And what the Bible says is as much as we should hurt, for all the evil and suffering in this world. Where does this evil and suffering come from? It came from our sin. And then the question is, what is sin? And we looked at Romans chapter 1. The most basic definition of sin is not murder. It's not actions. It's not lies. It's not lusting. It's not any of those things. The most basic definition of sin is our tendency to suppress, distort, ignore God's presence, character, and involvement in our lives. And we do that all the time, whether we grew up in the church or whether we're outside the church. Constantly, God is always trying to reveal his love, his character to us. And constantly, we are distorting that. We are suppressing that. We are rejecting that. And we're trying to live life our own way. And how did God respond to that, to our sin? We talked about through sin, death has been introduced into this world. Through our sin... We now have a corrupt mind where we can't think properly. Through our sin, our purpose, our meaning in life, there's going to be pain and suffering every, everywhere. And through our sin, God even cursed our environment. When we think about this world, when we think about environmental issues, when we think about even natural disasters, all those things originate not from God's creation. Because when God created everything, he said it was very good. All of those things originated from our sin and our consequence of sin. And that's where we left off last week. It was almost like a cliffhanger. And that leads us to this question. So if God responds to our sin in such a devastating state, did God do anything else beyond that? And that is the question that we're going to focus on is what is the solution? Because this is also a very vital food group of the gospel. What else did God do? So he responded by cursing and by paying, by making sure there are consequences to sin. But is there another response? And surely there is. So this is what we're going to focus on. Uh, the last basic food group is what is God's and our ultimate purpose. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So uh, like uh, Deacon Marcelo read, uh, I, I want to focus first on Ephesians chapter 2. And what else did God do? Did God just leave us in our state of misery? And I'm just going to highlight some of the verses that were already read. And Paul is writing... You and all of us, we were dead in our trespasses. We were dead in our sin. And again, what is sin? Sin is our tendency to distort, suppress, and ignore God's presence, his character, and involvement in our lives. All of us, we are dead in our sin. All of us are dead in our trespasses. 
Not only that, he says, in which once you walked, following the course of this world, all of us, we are so influenced by the rat race of our society. Following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, he goes on in detail, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. And this is something that many of us still do. When we think about materialism, when we think about lust, all these things come from the core sin of us distorting, suppressing, and ignoring God's character, involvement, and presence in our lives. We carry out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath. Paul is basically saying, you guys, all of us, rightfully speaking, we are dead in our sins and we are children of God's wrath. And really, that's, God didn't have to do anything. Because of our own rebellion, God could have just said, you know what, if that's what you want, if you want to live your life apart from my own involvement, apart from my own love, then forget about it. This is the cursed life that you're going to live. And the Bible could have ended that way and God would still be just. He would still be worthy of our worship. Because again, he's the one who created all of it. However, God doesn't just end the story that way. It says, but, and this is probably the most marvelous but in the Bible. But, God being rich in mercy and because of the great love with which he loved us. He didn't make that the end of the story. He didn't just leave us in the misery of death, sin, of our brokenness. But instead, even though he could have ended it that way, in his mercy, in his love, what did he do? Even though we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And what God basically did was in the midst of our sin, even though we were children of wrath, even though we were enemies before God, so rebellious, God said, that's not the end of the story. I'm going to send my only son. And this, these are the songs that we sing every week. Not only is my son going to live the perfect life, but he is going to die your death. The penalty of your rebellion, the penalty of your sin, all of that is going to be paid for by the death of Jesus Christ on that cross where his blood is pouring out profusely. I'm going to talk about this a little bit in more detail. Why did Jesus have to bleed? Why did it have to be death? Why did it have to be a cross? And not only did Jesus die to pay for all of our sins so that no matter what our past has been like, no matter what kind of mistakes we have been made, no matter what type of brokenness we come out of, God says, I'm not going to leave you in your misery. I, out of my mercy and my love, I'm going to give you a second chance. And I'm going to send my son Jesus Christ to die on that cross. And three days later, Jesus resurrects. And now we are made alive together with Christ. Now his spirit is living inside all of us who believe in this story of the gospel. And not only that, Paul goes on to write, God has raised us up with Jesus. So just like Jesus resurrected all of us, even though we come out of brokenness, even though we come out of sin, because Jesus resurrected all of us, we are raised to life with Jesus. And not only that, but God seats all of us with Jesus in the heavenly places. God has given us a privileged status, a privileged role in the heavenly places that we get to sit with Jesus, the Son of God. He has given us that type of privilege. Now, that was the too long, didn't listen to the rest of the sermon version of what the solution is. And if if you're not going to listen to the rest of the sermon, that's fine. But just understand this, what we read in Ephesians 2. God did not have to do anything. He could have left us in our misery. But out of his mercy, out of his love, he gave us a second chance. And not only did he give us a second chance, it cost God, his precious son, Jesus Christ, to die a horrific death. And not only did he die, but he, raised, he was raised to life so that we too, we can be raised. Now that is the short version of what is the solution. And if you take, if you take that home, then that's great. But I'm going to unpack this in a little bit more detail because the story of God's solution is actually so much deeper, so much more marvelous than what I just said. And that takes us to Ephesians chapter 1. 
Uh, I know some of us, uh, you know, the story of salvation is just amazing because salvation, God's salvation for us has a long history. It's not like God just woke up one day and said, you know what, I feel like I'm going to be nice. I feel like I'm going to be merciful. You know what, let me send my son Jesus Christ to resolve this problem of sin. It's not like God just did it out of the whim. This salvation plan has a long history. And similarly, for some of us, I know a lot of us are working professionals. I know we have a group of lawyers here. I know we have a group of people who are into home renovations, engineers. And imagine if you find out that in your family lineage, in your family ancestry, like, like family tree, your great, 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 great grandfather was a lawyer. And you're a lawyer. Or your great, 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 great grandmother was an engineer and you're an engineer or a, a carpenter or whatever. And you realize that not only was your great, 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 great grandfather an engineer or whatever, but that your ancestor was like the rock star of all lawyers. All the legal codes, all the best practices of engineering, guess where all that stuff was originated? It came from your great, 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 great grandfather, great, 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 great grandmother, whatever. I want to be gender neutral here. And you're thinking, wow, even though as a lawyer, as an engineer, as a, you know, home reno guy or whatever, even though my, my job feels a little frustrating at times, wow, my, my ancestor was like the rock star of all lawyers? And you feel a sudden urge of, wow, this is what I'm meant to do. I feel like this, my legal mind, my ability to problem solve in the world of engineering, all that stuff has, is not just something that I've been trained because I went to this particular university, but there is a long history behind that. And similarly, in salvation, there is a long history where it's not just God who thought of salvation, but here at New Hope, we believe in something called the Trinity. God is three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And what we see in salvation is before God created everything, before he even laid down the foundations of the world, the Father chose every single one of you. He chose to bless you, chose to save you. And then the Son is the one who executed that plan by coming down onto this earth, dying on that cross, being resurrected. And that's not enough. The Spirit is also involved, where the Spirit is what applies the gospel truths in our everyday life that we live until we see God face to face. And we're going to unpack all of that in Ephesians chapter 1. So let's take a look at this. So again, we read some of this. I'm not going to reread every single word. I'm just going to highlight some portions. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father. And what Paul is doing is he's not just talking about a generic entity of God. He is specifically focusing on the Father, the per, the, one of the persons of the Trinity. And what role does the Father play in our salvation, in this solution to our sin? Is he says, the Father, he has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, and he even chose us in Christ. And we're wondering, oh, he chose us? What does that mean, he chose us? And Paul spells it out, before the foundation of the world, he chose us. And just a month ago, we talked about how God created everything, and that's definitely true. But before God created the moons and the stars and the sun, before God created everything, according to this verse, he knew every single individual. And he chose to bless you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Next thing that we see, God predestined, the Father predestined for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. And we'll skip over, the Father blessed us in the beloved. And the reason why I really want to emphasize this, this idea of God choosing us, is when we think about the five basic food groups of the gospel, when we think about how God created everything to be so good, he created humanity to have the capacity to have a loving relationship with God. And what did we do? We sinned. We rebelled. What do we do on an everyday basis? We continually are, we succumb 
to the desires of our flesh, to the values of society, to really the desires of our sinful nature. But despite all of that, God knew that all of those things would happen in advance. And yet, he chose to bless you. He chose that you will receive salvation in Jesus Christ. And I know for some of us who grew up in the church, and again, this is what the question and answer is for. I know for some of us who grew up in the church, predestination, the idea of choosing, all that is so controversial. You're wondering, wait, if God predestined us, if he did all these things and do we have free will and all these different things, really, when you think about the Bible, when it talks about predestination, when it talks about election, these controversial things, it talks about these things very little in the grand scheme of things. Like if we were to have a pie chart, there would be one little sliver where the Bible explicitly talks about this idea of predestination. And the reason why God talks about predestination, election, all these different things, is not for us to have a philosophical debate about how does this reconcile with free will, about human liberty, all these different things. The reason why the Bible talks about predestination, election, all these different things, is for us to be so thankful that this gift of salvation has nothing to do with us and has everything to do with his love and mercy. It's really, it's not for us to have a logical debate, an argument. It's for us to praise and worship God and to thank God so much that he's in control over our lives. And when I think about for some of us, you know, I'm really thankful some of you guys have been opening up to some of the struggles that you're experiencing about your broken past, about all the pain from your childhood, family upbringing, all these different things. And even right now, I know some of us, we are bombarded with certain addictions, sinful habits, and we feel like, man, can I overcome these things? And I don't want to downplay any of that. But one thing that you can take to the bank is despite your struggles, despite you losing your battle against lust, against materialism, against envy, all these things that make us feel so shameful and guilty. And yes, we should repent for these things. But beyond that, guess what? God still chose you. God knew that you would struggle with every sin, everything that would be defiant, displeasing to God. And guess what? Even in the face of all of that, According to these verses, the father, before he created the world, he knew, I'm going to create Jason. I'm going to create Jude. I'm going to create Jeannie. I'm going to create Julia. I'm going to create Jubilee. And yes, they are going to break my heart time and time again. Yes, they're going to fall into this, whatever. But I choose to bless this precious child of mine. And this person is not going to, the final script is not going to be that person is going to lose his or her battle against this particular sin. The ultimate fate is this person is going to be in Christ. And I'm going to lavish every blessing in the heavenly places. That's what predestination is about. It's not about philosophical debates. It's about us being, wow, God, despite my sin, despite my rebellion, despite the lack of faith, the lack of trust, despite all the hurts, all the things that I do, before you create the world, you thought of me. And you decided, without a shadow of a doubt, that I'm going to be in Christ. Wow. The gospel is so powerful. So that's what the father does. What does the son do? And this is something that a lot of us talk about. The son, let's go to verse 7. In Jesus, we have redemption through Jesus' blood. And we sing about Jesus' blood. I love that one song where... His love became red, which is symbolic to Jesus' blood. And, uh, you know, Deacon Marcelo mentioned, we, we love question and answer. And one of the questions that came up that we weren't able to address, and again, I, I really want us to be able to address all of them. One of the questions, and that your non-Christians might have is, why did Jesus have to shed his blood? You know, we talk about the cross. We talk about the blood washing over us. Why blood? Is our God some gory God? Is, he, is this some like primitive religion? And the reason why blood is so important, there's a lot of reasons, but let me just focus on one. Is according to one book, I know not everybody grew up in the uh, a church, but according to one book in the Old Testament, Levit Leviticus chapter 17, God says the source of all life is found 
in our blood. Blood represents true life. If you look at an animal, the animal's life is bound up in its blood. And that's one of the themes that you see throughout Scripture. And again, I know that sounds very primitive, but even if you're in the biological sciences, you recognize the blood is so vital for your cells to sustain itself. The blood is so vital for your body to be healthy. When we think about even DNA, the best way for you to scan somebody's DNA is through your white blood cells. So that is true. It's not just some primitive thing that ancient people believed long time ago, but even in our scientific discoveries, we recognize the blood is so vital to life. Now, what does this have to do with Jesus? When Jesus sacrificed himself, he's saying, I'm not just going to pay for your sin, but I'm going to shed the very source of my life. In whatever way possible, he is trying to make it so clear that Jesus didn't just die on that cross, but he literally gave up his blood. He literally gave up his life so that we can find life. So when the blood of Jesus covers over us, yes, it washes away all of our sin, and that's true. But another way of looking at it is the life of Jesus now covers over all of us. And that's the reason why, if you've read these verses, if you read, if you read the New Testament, especially Paul's writing, do you notice, and I, I highlight this up until now, do you notice how Paul keeps repeating the phrase, in him, in Jesus, in the beloved, in Christ, over and over again, ad nauseum. And the reason being is because Paul is saying, what is the solution? Salvation is not some ticket to heaven that you just wait to until you get to the pearly gates and say, God, let me in. I got my ticket. Salvation is not just you being free from your addictions or from your broken past. All those things are true. I'm not, I'm not downplaying those things. But salvation truly at its core is that you get to be in Christ. You get to be united with Christ. When God looks at you, it is as if God doesn't just see Jason. He doesn't just see these various individuals. He sees his son, Jesus, and he is greatly pleased with all of us. If we are covered in the blood of Jesus. So that's the role of the son in terms of salvation. What is the role of the spirit? Because we talked about the father, we talked about the son, and Paul also wants to bring some spotlight to the spirit as well. So these are the last two verses that we'll, we'll cover Verse 13, in him, and again, the language in him, and that's referring to Jesus. In Jesus, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And here what I really want to focus on and what we see in the Spirit is our ability to hear and believe God's word, our ability to hear and believe God's gospel, is not based on our ability to rationally interpret things. It's simply by the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit enables us to understand the heart of God, to understand the character of God, for us to understand the gospel. Uh, let me just piggyback on the sermon from last week, Romans 1, 18-32. For those of us who are here, we talked about one of the consequences of sin is that our minds are so distorted. You know, I hear a lot of non-Christians, they say, just give me proof, give me evidence for God's existence. According to Romans 1, this whole creation, all this world is filled and replete and brimming with God's, with proof and testimonies and evidences that our God is living. But the problem is, because of our sinful heart and our sinful mind, we can't properly understand these things. And what Paul is saying is, thankfully, God didn't just leave us with a depraved and distorted mind. God has given us the spirit so that the spirit enables us to not only hear the gospel truth, but to actually have the faith and the trust to believe in it. Left to ourselves, like, you said, like we just read, Ephesians chapter 2, we are so dead in our sins. We are so dead as child children of disobedience. But it's only through the Spirit that enables us 
to be able to recognize, wait, God, you are true. Wait, the things I'm hearing of the gospel, that is true. That is the work of the Spirit. All of the blessings that God has in store for us through Jesus, all the blessings of us becoming more like Christ, thinking properly, living life properly, being able to love others in a selfless love, all these things that all of us, even society, we all aspire, we all esteem, those are things that God has available for us through salvation. But those things cannot actually take place in our lives without the role of the Spirit. Because apart from the Spirit, apart from God's grace, sin has devastated our hearts to the point where there's nothing good that we can do. And that's the reason why the Spirit is called the guarantee of our inheritance. As much as God wants to bless us with all these blessings, all the inheritance, the only way that we can actually experience that inheritance is through the Spirit living in us. And the good news is the Spirit, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you believe in the gospel, one guarantee is the Spirit is living inside of you, changing the way that you think, changing the way that you live so that you can be more like Jesus every single day. So that is the solution. Again, we can go further. We can dig deeper. But for the purposes of the five basic food groups, that's basically what it is in a nutshell. Now, I want to spend some time and I want us to reflect upon some of these truths. And I want us to be able to connect this with the rest of the gospel. But before we do that, uh, I know that there are a lot of things, there are a lot of questions. And I just want to turn our attention